Welcome to another lecture on the history of Nineveh. It's a sad history. The mightiest, the most beautiful, the richest, the wealthiest. Next to the Tigris River, it was a dream with its huge buildings. And suddenly, 612 became a hoop, heap of rubble, only discovered 2,000 years later. Why was Nineveh dis destroyed? And I'm looking into my own heart. Nineveh was cruel. The way they treated people was something shocking. And I was thinking of myself. You know, sometimes we're unkind. We are cruel to people. One of the cruelties is the unforgiving spirit. People need your forgiveness and you... You punish them. Or you're unfaithful to your spouse. That's cruelty. Don't do it to his creatures. And may God help us rather to be kind and loving. Then we'll never end up in a heap of ruins and scandals. This is the ninth lecture. There's only one left. We're looking at Nahum. And we're going to do an exegesis, an explanation of every verse of chapter 3. We are discussing the third and the fourth descriptions of the fall of Nineveh. This is what you see before my runes in the background. The pathetic heap of runes. <laughs> You're looking at modern symbols of success next to failure in the background. And the message, avoid my mistakes. Be kind to people and not cruel and become a successful person. So the ruins and the success are displayed in this picture. May God give that uh, you'll be a success picture and not a ruined picture. This third description of my destruction, chapter 3, 1 to 7, explains further the why for my fall. Whereas the first two descriptions in the previous chapter gave more of the actual events, the what if it, the what of it. Uh, these are similarities between the descriptions of the siege in chapter 2, 3 to 4, and uh, chapter 3, verses 2 and 3. However, this section has been called a woe oracles. Whoa, whoa, whoa. It's a sad word, whoa. And it usually comes too late. When the damage has been done, it's whoa, it's gone. My marriage, my friendship, whoa, whoa, whoa. A whoa oracles, whoa oracles, because it pronounces doom on another in typical whoa oracle fashion. And the next lecture, the last one, we're going to see how Nahum uses these woe oracles, treaties that they used, that he used in his description of their fall. Woe to the bloody city. It is all full of lies and robbery. Its victim never departs. Bloody city. This refers to me, a place where blood was shed freely and apparently without any qualms or conscience. Are you insensitive to the needs of people? Are you let people suffer pain because of your attitude? My monuments abundantly depict how captives were flayed, decapitated, impaled alive, or hanged by hands and feet to die in slow torture. These and other inhuman practices reveal my cruelty. Look at this. This is shocking. My royal inscriptions continually exult over the number of enemies killed. We wanted to destroy people for many years. If you hate people, you're doing the same that I did, I, Nineveh. Captives carried off, cities razed and plundered, lands wasted and fruit trees destroyed. 
Oh, this is my history. How sad. Just look at this. I hated people. And I let them suffer. You know, it's so much better to love people and let lift them and not be destroyed. There are so wonderful lessons for us to learn from my mistakes. How terrible it will be for Nineveh. How terrible it will be for Nineveh. Why? It is a city of murderers. It is full of liars. It's filled with stolen goods. The killing never stops. Corruption and cruelty. We need to ask God to give us a new heart, a kind heart. Do you think I never deserve this destruction? Yes, I do. The noise of a whip and the noise of rattling wheels, of galloping horses, of clattering chariots. Look at the parallels here. The noise of a whip and the noise of rattling wheels, of galloping horses, of clattering chariots. Beautiful Hebrew parallelism. The prophet here describes the sounds and the advance of the besieging armies, even as he has already described their outward appearance. The noise of a whip and the noise of rattling wheels, of galloping horses, of clattering chariots. This is beautiful Hebrew poetry. He hears, as it were, the charioteers crackling of whips, the rumble of chariot wheels, the galloping horses, and the leaping forward of the chariots. Whip, wheels, horses, chariots. Can you hear the deafening noise? This is some of the greatest literature poetry that you are listening to. Horsemen charge with bright sword and glittering spear. There is a multitude of slain, great number of bodies, countless corpses, they stumble over the corpses. And look again at the parallel here. Horses charged with bright sword, where's the parallel? And glittering spear, speaking of the same thing, but gives you more nuances. Multitude slain, great number of bodies, countless corpses corpses. He, he takes a theme, this Nahum, and he elaborates on it, explains it. Horsemen charged with bright sword and glittering spear. Multitudes, multitudes. So many were slain, slain that the living warriors stumble over them and are delayed in their progress. Oh, this was a terrible sight. 612. When this all happened to me because of my cruelty, God wanted to save me, and but I did not allow him to save me. Because of the multitude of harlotries, of the seductive harlot, the mistress of sorceries, who sells nations through her harlotries and families through her sorceries. An expression used figuratively of idolatry. Idolatry was another reason for my fall. Inasmuch as my idolatry was grossly immoral, to designate it as wardoms was doubly fitting. I was so wicked. God wanted to change me, but I refused him. Behold, I'm against you. This is terrible, says the Lord of hosts. I will lift your skirts over your face and I will show the nations your nakedness and the kingdoms your shame. Why? Because of my harlotries. God will punish me most ignominiously as a harlot. I will cast abominable filth upon you, make you vile and make you a spectacle. And you know, I read this before the destruction, but I ignored it because I thought I was the world's mightiest capital with the mightiest army, the wealthiest. Don't depend on your resources. Repent and depend upon God. 
continuing, continuing the figure of the harlot, the prophet foretells that I would suffer, as I said before, ignominy, ignominy, and ill treatment that such a woman might receive from the rabble. It shall come to pass that all who look upon you will flee from you and say, oh, 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 none of you is laid waste. Who will be moaner? Where shall I seek comforters for you? Who will be moan me? That's a rhetorical question indicating that none will feel sorry for me inasmuch as I deserved to be punished. Can you imagine I made such a lot of enemies? When I needed friends, I had none because I treated them cruelly. And if you treat your friends in a cruel manner, when disaster struck, there will be nobody that will be there to help you. Flee indicates the extreme punishment to come upon me, for the terrible sight would cause the beholder to hasten away. They don't want to look at this. And then the fourth description of Nineveh's fall, chapter 3, 8 to 19, it says, This section, another message that Nahum delivered concerning Nineveh's fall, begins by comparing it to the fall of another great city. Nahum proceeded to use many figures of speech to describe how variously segments of Ninevite society would respond to the coming invasion. The literary form of this section is that of a taunt song. You know, Nahum did everything possible to help me wake up. But I kept on sleeping. You know, if you do not admit your guilt and your sins, there is no future for you because then God cannot heal you. And here it comes. Are you better than Noamon that was situated by the river that had the waters around her whose rampant was the sea whose wall was the sea? Again, Hebrew parallelism. Speaking of the canals and the Euphrates that flowed, uh, the Nile that flowed next to me. Now, Amon, the city of the Egyptian god Amun. The Egyptians thought that Amun was strong and Amun could save them. Ancient thieves, Thebes, made a mistake. If you depend on your man-made gods, you will be disappointed. And Noam writes this to me, to shock me, telling me that no Amun, Nineveh, Nineveh destroyed her. We destroyed her. And of course, now Noam says, as you destroyed Thebes, modern Karnuk, so I, I will destroy you. And I, I remember the vivid story when Ashur Banipal came back and telling us about how he, how he destroyed the city who trusted their god Amun. The celebrated city with its tombs of the kings, its colossi of, and sphinxes, its great temples of Karnak and Luxor with their massive columns and colonnades was superbly situated on the Nile as I was on the Tigris. Now I'm warns me that, in the sight of heaven, I'm no better than Thebes and can easily meet with the same fate and I did not listen. Is somebody telling you you're on the wrong way? Please listen. It had been destroyed in 663 by my king Ashur Bani Paul, king of Assyria. Are you, Nineveh? Better than No Amon, that was situated by the river, that had the waters around her, whose rampant was the sea, whose wall was the sea. Here Naamon used to refer to the Nile River, see, see, see. In the Old Testament, large rivers were sometimes called seas. 
The closing clause simply means that the Nile with its canals constituted the wall or the defences of the Thebes. Of Thebes. And now was telling me that the Tigris River is no guarantee that I will not dis be destroyed like Thebes. Ethiopia and Egypt were a strength. She had these mighty allies. And it was boundless. Put and Lubim were your helpers. Egypt, whose people joined with the Nubians, constituted a power that was infinite, or without number, so to speak, that was destroyed. And Nahum warned me can happen to me. And I ignored it. Don't ignore warning messages from the prophets of God. Yet she was carried away. Now listen what happened here. She went into captivity. So now was telling me the same thing is going to happen to you if you do not repent. And my dear friend, if you live in sin, Runes upon runes and shame upon shame awaits you. Ask God to give you a clean heart. She went into captivity. Her young children also were dashed to pieces. Do you get this? Would this happen to me? Would the Medes, the Babylonians do this to my children? This didn't even shock me. At the head of every street, they cast lots for her honourable men, and all her great men were bound in change. The strength of Thebes and her apparently unlimited resources, including the help of her confederates, did not save her from destruction. The same thing will happen to me. If I rely upon my resources, I am doomed to failure. And if you rely on your sources for success, you're heading for ruins. Yet she was carried away. She went into captivity. Her young children also were dashed to pieces. Dashed to pieces. Part of the usual cruel treatment often handed out to the conquered cities in ancient times, taking the babies from their mothers and smash them against the walls. Naam said to me, Nineveh, don't do it, it's going to happen to you. You also will be drunk, you will be hidden, you also will seek refuge from the enemy as Thebes did. You also, you also. The prophet returns to addressing me, Nineveh. Be hidden, it says here. What does it mean? Be hidden. It means that I, Nineveh, would reveal no power to resist. It's finished. All your strongholds are fig trees with ripened figs. If they are shaken, they fall into the mouth of the eater. Surely your people in your midst are women. Contrast with the strength of a man. The gates of your land are wide open for your enemies. Fire shall devour the bars of your gates. Woman is warning me. The hitherto bold, brave Assyrian soldiers of mine will act like women in the sense that they would not be able to resist, the def to, to resist and defeat the besieging armies, weak in strength like women. No one pleads with me, and the same prophet pleads with you. Be careful. God does not want you to be lost or to be ruined. He wants you to be with him forever. Don't hate. Don't be cruel to people. 
throw water from the siege, fortify your strongholds, go into the clay and tread the mortar, make strong the bricklin. Fortify, that is strengthen places in the fortifications that may be weak. This is sarcasm. The prophet, speaking with a touch of irony, bids me, me, Nineveh, do everything possible to prepare for a long, hard siege. There the fire will devour you, the sword will cut you off. It will eat you up like a locust. Make yourself many like the locust. Make yourself many like the swarming locusts. In spite of every care taken to strengthen these needful places of fortifications, fire will devour, burn up the city. Archaeology has clearly shown that this prophecy was literally fulfilled. In, in the literature you can see the skeletons of the victims of the 612 destruction of me, Nineveh. Locusts. The prophet used this figure here and in the following verse to show that the destruction of Nineveh would be as sudden and complete as that wrought on the vegetation by these insects. You know, Noam did everything to save me from this scandal, this destruction, and I would not listen. It was too late for me. Too late. Make yourself many. Though I and my Assyrians should assemble armies as numerous as the hordes of locusts, it would avail nothing. You have multiplied your merchants more than the stars of heaven. The locust plunders and flies away. He pleads with me. Now says, please, Nineveh, don't let this happen to you. I, Nineveh, was advantageously situated to carry on an extensive commerce with other countries. I had all the money in the world. But these trade relationships would be of no avail. The destruction affected by my enemies would be swift and complete. Your commanders are like swarming locusts and your generals like great grasshoppers which camp in the hedges on the cold day. When the sun rises, they flee away, and the place where they are is not known. As locusts become inactive in cold weather, so my Assyrian leaders and officials would become powerless. The only thing left for my army was to flee away, that is, to perish, and sadly, to disappear. I lost everything because I ignored the pleadings of Prophet Naum. Is a prophet pleading with you? Please listen. Your shepherds slumber, O king of Assyria. Your nobles rest in dust. Your people are scattered on the mountains and no one gathers them. The leaders of my nation are here represented as being asleep to their responsibilities as well as being killed in battle, sleeping the sleep of death with their leaders gone. My people can no longer offer an effective resistance to their enemies. Believe in the prophets and you will be prosperous. Your injury has no healing. Nineveh, you will never become something in future. You will disappear. Your wound is severe. All who hear news of you will clap their hands over you. For upon whom has not your wickedness passed continually for centuries? This is what you did. I pledged with you and you ignored my prophetic warning. At the news of my downfall, the surrounding nations are pictured as clapping their hands 
in joy because I will mean because it will mean the end of my ceaseless wickedness and restless, relentless oppression. When you die, will some people be happy? If you die, will they clap their hands? Ask God to make you a kind person. That there will be tears, not clapping of hands when you die. The prophet ends his message on a note of certainty and finality. Your injury has no healing. Because you refused healing. During the preaching of Jonah, I received grace. I repented. I became a kind to Nineveh. Alas, mercy is ended. My runes plead with the world to accept grace. Here it is too late. My runes plead with you to be kind. Next time, the vassal treaties of Esaradon, VTE, reveal the astonishing facts that Nahum uses the same threads when he addresses the destruction of Nineveh. This was a tremendous discovery I've made. Hope to see you next time. Father in heaven, search our hearts. Are we cruel because of an unforgiving spirit? Are we cruel to people because we hate them? Do we send messages of cruelty in our body language to people? Please forgive us. I will learn the lessons that Nineveh did not learn. In Jesus' name, Amen. Thank you for watching this presentation. To subscribe to our channel, click here, then click the bell to get notifications. For the next presentation, click here. See you next time.